So, uh, w welcome everybody to uh, this uh, first seminar of uh, the series uh, Fundamental Ideas of Amazing Logic of uh, Molecular Biology. And uh, all these seminars uh, are linked to uh, a book that we plan to write with uh, Misha Gomov and Francois Kepes, uh, which are also here. And um, all these seminars will be, so this book is about a brilliant and uh, breakthrough ideas of uh, biology. And all these all this seminars so are linked to this book and will be about uh, really uh, outstanding and interesting topics uh, in molecular biology and uh, they, are, um, they are for all scientists. So the, the audience will be mathematicians, biologists, physicists. And so today we are uh, you are, well, you are pleased to welcome uh, Vincent Collot. Uh, so Vincent Collot is a CNRS uh, research director at uh, IBENS, which is a biology institute uh, inside UNS. Uh, and uh, his uh, main uh, work interest, topic interest, is uh, epigenomics and epigenetics in Arabidopsis italiana, and especially transgenerational epigenetics, and that's the subject of today. Thank you, Jérôme, and thank you, François and Misha, for your very kind invitation. Um, so, I think what I'll, I'll build up on what Annick uh, presented to you just last week. Uh, I haven't listened to all of her seminar, but I took bits and pieces from, from what she said, and therefore it should be fairly straightforward for me to get, uh, to get into uh, uh, today's topic without uh, too much introduction again. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about what we call transgenerational epigenetics. So what matters here is whether or not epigenetic states, and we will define them as we go along, can be transmitted across multiple generations. And not just actually between parents and offspring, but across multiple generations. And, there, and therefore whether or not they can fall into the realm of genetics, which is a science of heredity. Okay, let's start with chromatin. You already had an introduction about that, so you have to remember here, or, or you don't have to remember, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk about epigenetic phenomena that can cross generations in eukaryotes. And most of what we know in terms of epigenetics in eukaryotes, whether or not it crosses generations or it's part of a developmental programs, lies on the fact that uh, DNA is not naked in the cell, but it's first within the confines of the nucleus and is organized in a very complex structure called the chromatin, which is made up of uh, a basic unit, the nucleosome. And this unit is there to um, compact DNA, but to do just more than compact DNA, is to modulate accessibility of DNA within the confines of the, of the, nucleus, of the nucleus within a, a eukaryotic cell. So here you have a eukaryotic cell with a nucleus inside, and this uh, very simplified cartoon depicting uh, the DNA double helix to start with, sort of folding into more and more complex structure with the basic unit of chromatin, the nucleosome, which is made up of DNA, of course, and histones on which uh, the DNA is wrapped, and then higher organization structures, which I'm not going to get into today. So what you have to realize is that we know that chromatin, uh, we have, well, sorry, we have known for a long time now that chromatin comes in many different flavors. And the first description of this uh, was due to this uh, botanist, Emil Hax, in 1928. So it's sort of the basic um, tools of microscopy. What he could find that within the nucleus of this time um, most cells, uh, you could distinguish two types of chromatins. Euchromatin, this sort of a loosely packed uh, structure here, and what he called heterochromatin. So these two terms are actually his, uh, his terminology. And so this is the first time that you will uh, hear about euchromatin and heterochromatin. And, and, and he also realized that genes, units that will sort of dictate certain phenotypes, resided mainly within euchromatin. And that heterochromatin was this sort of compact chromatin state that did, did not seem to, to change much from cell division to cell division, or, and, and did not seem to contain much genetic information. How do you go do that? that so very, very careful observation and very good deduct uh, deductive uh, skills, I guess. 
uh, and, and, and some genetics. So the combination of the three, genetics. But how could say which gene was in which part of chromatin? The genes were not defined. Well, I, I invite you to actually read this paper, which you can find readily online. I haven't done this for a while, so I could not give, provide you an answer. The genes were not identified, actually. The genes were uh, abstract entities at that time. Absolutely. And, you and I haven't talked about anything yeah. concrete here. But you say, no, no, I say gene, but genes were not related to the chromatin at that time. It was not understood. Well, no, 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 genes were related to chromatin in as much as we knew, I mean, from the work of Morgan, that there was this. Uh, there were genes, but they're not related directly to the DNA. Nobody knew what was. And I haven't talked about DNA here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> the gene is a concept, and that's actually gene and genetics are two independent concepts that were uh, proposed or invented more or less at the same time one in 1909 uh, and the other one in 1917. But what we have from, uh, since 1903 is the chromosomal theory of heredity. So we knew that somehow genetic information, whatever it meant, was carried by chromosomes. Absolutely. And then, you know, you add another 20 years, you get some you know, beautiful microscopy, and then people realize that chromatin is a substance of chromosomes. And genes reside within chromosomes. I'm not talking about DNA. Sorry, I apologize. I did talk about DNA in the previous slide. That's why you are confused. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing this uh, introduction in the wrong way. But I want, I mean, this is what you heard last week, okay? What I want you to realize is that we knew very early on, before indeed we knew that DNA was the material yeah, yeah, okay, sub yeah. uh, substance of heredity. We knew long before that chromatin came in different flavors and these different flavors were associated with different potential of expressing traits via genes. Genes being a concept, not a physical entity at the time. And again, still in uh, with a uh, historical perspective, built on these sort of early observations and subsequent observations, Marine Island proposed in, in 74 that different chromatin states, namely euchromatin and heterochromatin, could co uh, be associated with different transcription states. So now we have DNA. We have a central dogma established from DNA to RNA to protein. And now we bring back chromatin and DNA function. Because for a long time, chromatin was only thought as a packaging device, only there to put these two meters of hum, uh, human DNA into the confines of the nucleus, which is about 10 micrometers uh, in diameter. Okay. So chromatin was studied on its own, independent of gene function or the way genes were regulated. And Mary Lyon was one of the first few people, I mean, together with Barbara McClintock and others, to bring the two together. Actually, it's McClintock who started that in a way, realizing that depending on, on, on chromatin states, you could have different phenotypes being expressed at the surface of, uh, of, of maize kernels. Okay, and here what you see is he also came up with this notion of constitutive heterochromatin, which corresponds to the heterochromatin that uh, Emil Heitz defined, which is constantly uh, condensed throughout the cell cycle, so not only during um, uh, mitosis, uh, but also during what we call the interface, so when typically chromatin sort of unwraps a little bit so that DNA gets more accessible to the transcription machinery, etc., etc. So, but this is considered by chromatin, and basically what she had is this coding chromatin, the one with function, which could exist in an active or in an active state. And what she had in mind here was the notion that even active chromatin could sometimes transiently exist in an heterochromatic state. So you have constitutive heterochromatin and you have facultative heterochromatin. So there was a, a, a dimension of dynamics. Before, with Emil Heitz, we just had two types of chromatin. Now, with Mary Lyon, we go one step beyond and from even open chromatin could exist in different states and these states could relate to different ways genes are turned on or turned off. So I think this, this is important. I mean, it's a very, of course, a coarse way of uh, of describing what, what happened over the course of uh, 20 or 30 years, but nonetheless, this is probably one of the early indications that chromatin states per se could be very important in dictating or in contributing to different uh, states of uh, gene activity. And now this is a picture we all know. Okay, so we have chromatin, it's a basic unit, the, the nucleosome, and Annick uh, mentioned to you last week that at the uh, uh, the end, uh, end of, uh, 
of histone, especially histone H3 and histone H4, we have all kinds of modifications that can happen on, on specific amino acid residues, and these modifications somehow together color or put a flavor to the nucleosome that will be either permissive for transcription or repressive for uh, gene activity. So you could modulate gene activity through this set of modifications. And there was also a, a modification on the DNA itself, not just on the histones, or on which the DNA is what, but also on the DNA itself. And this is 5-methylcytosine, which we find in many eukaryotes. Not, not in all eukaryotes, I'll go back to that in a minute, but in many eukaryotes. And in addition, I don't know if I need uh, mention it to you, but we also have what we call histone variants. Histones are among the most conserved proteins in the eukaryotic world. I mean, this unit is universal among eukaryotes. And yet, you do find a whole variety of histone variants which replace the canonical histones, and when they come in, instead of a canonical histone, of course, they bring with them a whole new set of properties to nucleosomes and therefore to chromatin, which you could relate. It happens dynamically really quite Very, very so. dynamic. It's extremely dynamic. So you have chaperones bringing them in, picking them out, uh -huh. deciding, here, I want this one, this one here, please, not, don't mess. But they produce the same genes and modify. No, no, these are variants. So these are coded by different genes. By different genes. Uh, histone, by different so you genes. have the canonical histones, which are high, uh, extremely well conserved yeah. across eukaryotes. And then, and then you have these variants. And some of them are also very conserved. But others can now diverge between different eukaryotic branches. Okay, and, then, and, and therefore this led to the notion of one genome. So we all have inherited only one genome from our parents. So one chromosome set from our mother, one chromosome set from our father. And, and, and this is what we have to deal with. And then, you know, to unravel this, genomic, uh, this genetic program, we have to turn on, turn off different genes at different times. And this is what chromatin will, uh, will allow the cell to do. And therefore, for one genome, you'll have a multiplicity of epigenomes. Okay, so you're all familiar with this notion. It's basically what uh, most people uh, will refer to when they mean epigenetics. Um, nowadays, it's basically different flavors of chromatin, associated, causing, consequence, whatever, uh, of, of gene activity of differential gene activity. Now, among all of these modifications, one is particularly interesting to consider because of its inherent properties to be serving not only as a, a chromatin mark, but indeed as an epigenetic mark which could be transmitted across cell divisions with, a, with extreme fidelity. And 5-methylcytosine, uh, so this is uh, the addition of the methyl group on the carbon-5 of uh, the um, one of the four bases that make up the DNA, cytosines. And so we have known for quite a while, since the 60s, that indeed in many uh, eukaryotes, in particular in mammals, we have this modification as part of the uh, uh, DNA makeup of a, of a cell. And two people, uh, Robin and Holiday, and Art Riggs, uh, at the same time, or right, in, in, in the 75, both proposed that the imitation could serve as the true epigenetic mark that we confer different uh, uh, states of gene activity um, to a cell. And that could be faithfully transmitted across cell divisions, just like DNA, DNA, uh, DNA can be transmitted faithfully through replication. So here we have a, a, a similar system. And the key points about their proposal is that first, that of course, delimitation could affect gene expression. That changes in delimitation could explain the switching and on and off of genes during development. So it was a developmental process, a dynamic process. They predicted the existence of enzymes that could methylate DNA. First, you know, de novo, so to establish delimitation, and then a set of enzymes that could perpetuate this methylation states for what they called maintenance uh, methylation activity, and that demethylation could indeed be irritable uh, thanks to the action of this uh, maintenance DNA methylases. And to cut a long story short, here is basically what we know about the perpetuation of uh, demethylation states in mammals today. And here, there is one key uh, component to this uh, system, which is that demethylation in mammals is almost exclusively 
found at, uh, uh, within a very specific uh, sequence context, CG dinucleotides. So when you read CG on the top strand of the DNA, remember DNA is a double helix, so you have a complementary strand, and what you have here is again CG. So it's a, what we call a symmetric site. So when you replicate methylated, <coughs> so first of course you have to oppose the demethylation for the, in, 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 a, in the first place, and you do that through what are called de novo demethylation activities. So you decide that you want to methylate these two cytosines, for, example, for instance, in these two uh, uh, CG dinucleotides here and here. So you bring in demethylation, and now, just through the activity of this maintenance medium transferase, once you have replicated your DNA, you use information which is in the on the template strand, this methylated cytosine on the, on, on the template strand. And now what you realize is that what you have here is what we call a heavy methylated CPG site, base pair. And now you just instruct somehow the methyltransferase of maintenance to put the methylation opposite mm -hmm. the methylated cytosine which is on the template strand. So it is a semi-conservative replicative process. It's known in detail how it works? Or not in Absolutely. We're not going to go there today. But in chemistry, are beautifully understood. There is extrusion of cytosine. And, and, and we know that there is a key co-effector of this reaction. It recognizes the heavy methylated nature of this uh, CPG dinucleotide. Recognizes that there is only methylation on one of the two strands. And that somehow brings in this maintenance medium transferase, which is a different one from this one. This one is a de novo, it's in mammals it's called DNNT3. This one is a maintenance, it's called DNNT1 in mammals, and DNNT1 only works with this accessory factor on heavy methylated DNA. So it can only do perpetuation. In fact, in vitro, this one can also do de novo. But in vivo, its main function is to do perpetuation of methylation states through replication, through DNA replication. So this is a beautiful system. You first decide to methylate a gene, for instance, to switch it on or off, and then you can perpetuate, so you can memorize this state across multiple cell divisions because you have a system of maintenance. And we know that this is key to many developmental processes, like X inactivation or uh, well, there is a feedback there. So once you methylate that, the system which does methylation will become actuated. There is a positive feedback of the system. There is no feedback. Yeah, you no, because you have to make a decision to methylate. Ah, you you have, this is a developmental decision. A uh, at the moment you methylate, you have a decision being enforced. You need feedback in the system, right? I don't do that. On one thing, you methylate, you block some gene. On the other hand, there is a process which does it, and this might be activated. Right? So there are two three decisions to make. Methylate and activate the process which makes methylation. So it's another gene that you No, know, this is, okay, well, I mean, I guess you're right, but what we know is that this activity of denomitic transfer is you can find it throughout development in, in, in mammals, for instance. Ah, so it's, it's not mammals, it works everywhere. Okay. Well, More there are key, key moments, of course, in development where you will find it you know, most highly expressed and most, most active, which is uh, during, um, you know, in the germline, and I will get back to it, as well as during uh, early embryogenesis. There you have a lot of de novo activity. Mm -hmm. But you can find the dentist reactivity at other stages in development. So I don't think we have a comprehensive view, uh, picture right now of when this no, decision... No, but you say, you say decide a particular place to be So it must be, decision must be somewhere... Now, where, how do you decide that yeah. you want to make it at least two yeah. CPGs, but not the one next door? Right. That's another question. And we're not going to go there today. Okay. Sorry. I can't do everything, otherwise you'll hear me for two or three, three days in a row here. Okay, so now this very simple system of memory, of cell memory, is critical for at least two processes in mammals. One is called X inactivation, and that concerns only two of us in this room. So these are the two female of the species that we have uh, today. So basically, ladies, when you were conceived, soon after you were conceived, so basically uh, within a, a few uh, cell divisions, there was a process which took place at random in every cell of the embryo to inactivate one of your two X chromosomes. Because it's not good to have two X chromosomes when you only have one. You need to balance the dosage of genes that are sitting on X chromosomes between male and females. We know that dosage is key to everything in, the, in, in, uh, in development. If you have a trisomy 21, 
we know that you have phenotypic consequences. You have the Down syndrome. What is transgenic 21? It's chromosome 21, the smallest one of human uh, chromosomes. Only 256 genes on chromosome 21. If you have three copies out of, instead of two, so 1.5 fold increase in copy number, you have the phenotypic consequences that we all know about. And what is the consequence of not being you never, you, know, you you'll never be here to ask a question. Basically, this is immediate. This is embryonic abortion. This, this is. You, you, uh, I think the embryo dies at about uh, in a mouse uh, within uh, three or four days. Completely fertile. Completely fertile. So you can't survive with two exes. I'm mean, sorry, with two active exes. Of course, you have two exes in every cell of your body, including, of course, in your germline, because you want. To transmit your X to your progeny, but yeah, only one of the two is active, and that's it. And this is a decision you take very early, uh, which is taken very early on during embryogenesis, and to which you stick. Once you have decided in one cell to inactivate your X that you receive from your mother or from your father, then all the progeny uh, sorry, uh, of that particular cell, so all the cell lineage now will have kept the inactive X. Well, well can you keep X from, from your father? Sorry? X may come from the father? It has to come from the father. X. It has to. Yeah? I mean, if you're a daughter, it's because you have two X's. I so have, have two X's with you, yes. You only got one X, where did right. it come from? Yeah, where, where does your X come from? Your dad or your mom? Yeah. Yeah, my, my mother, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you guess well, right. absolutely. You only got your uh, well, Y yeah. chromosome from right. your dad. I see, it's your okay. question, but I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. I make this mistake from time to time. And so, once you have made this decision, this is it. You, you are stuck with it throughout your life. And that's why you get this calico cat. What is it? It's a cat which was heterosexual, it's a female, and I'm going to use some genetic parlance, but you know, to ignore it. It's heterozygous at this color code locus. So one chromosome, I don't know if it was from the mother or from the father, but the, one of the two chromosomes that this female cat inherited carries a black uh, gene. The same gene here on the other chromosome now it does not uh, uh, condition black color but orange color. Because of this random process which takes place very early on of X inactivation, some cells will inactivate the black allele and therefore you can only express the orange color code in this cell and all of its progeny. So, uh, okay. Or you will inactivate the orange allele in another cell at random. It's one of the two. And of course, now you will be able to expect the black, the black allele. And I told you, this is now something that is memorized completely. So all of the daughter cells from that cell which took this decision will be orange. All the daughter cells that uh, took this decision are now black. That's why you, at the end of the day, when you have now a fully expanded cat, you have plaques of black fur next to plaques of orange fur and never the two together because this was a very early decision in development and, and you, you have this sort of clonality then, sort of expanding, yes? Oh, this is DNA methylation, my mistake. This is DNA methylation, this key modification I was talking about. Black methylated, uh, empty circles, no methylation on these cytosines, on these CPG. Thank you. So this is it, okay? And this is critical, as I said. You can't survive without it. Sorry, is the old chromosome which is inactivated or is each gene... So it's a beautiful, I mean, sorry, it's a very important question you ask. You know what, I think I'm going to do it as I always do when I talk about epigenetics. I have, of course, a program, and then we're just going to talk. So, yes, it's a... It's a very important question you ask. Is it a, a decision taken at the level of individual genes or the whole chromosome? It is a whole chromosome. And it's a very beautiful and complex process. Again, I'm not going to go into any of the details today. But it is a chromosome decision, which is taken by one particular locus in this chromosome. So it's, it starts from one place, but then it says, OK, I want my entire chromosome to be blanketed with whatever, so that we turn it off. But there are escapees. So in the mouse, 
not too many escaping, escaping the two X's, okay? So some genes will now still be expressed from both chromosomes. In humans, a lot of genes seem to be escapees. So there we have a kind of mosaic picture along the chromosome. Some of them will be subjected to this random X inactivation process, which is a chromosome decision, but others will be sort of hidden from this decision. And we still be maintaining that, uh, we maintain the expression from, from both ends. From both chromosomes, sorry. Okay, so that's a really beautiful example. Another example that you probably heard from uh, Annick last week is genomic imprinting, parental imprinting. I think she mentioned that to you. The fact that basically, you know, we receive a, a one chromosome set from our mother, one chromosome set from our father. We are diploid organisms. For each chromosome, we have a pair, in fact. Chromosome 1, a pair, chromosome 21, a pair, XX, a pair of X, or XY if we are uh, males. So we have these two contributions, but they are not equal either. You could have the same DNA sequence, and this has been done experimentally in the mouse, and yet some genes will only be expressed according to their parent of origin. They will be expressed if they came from the father, or other genes will only be expressed if they came. So this is a case where here, this particular gene called IGF2 will be expressed only on the fraternally derived uh, uh, chromosome. It's not an X, it's another chromosome, it's an autosome. Now, this particular gene called H19, which is actually linked to IGF2, now will only be expressed from the maternally derived chromosome. So now you have, again, a situation where the two are not completely equivalent. They don't know still what it does, but the, the, the Phenotypic consequences are quite dramatic. You all have heard about mules and henny. What is a mule and a henny? It's the same genome at the end of the day, except that one was a male donkey with a female horse, whereas the other one was a male horse with a female donkey. At the end of the day, they still have one set of chromosomes from a donkey, one from a, a horse, but the phenotypes are dramatically different. And this is reproducible. This is you know, dictated by, by development, so this is a very robust system. It's so only one, one gene in this case? Oh, no, 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 it's plenty. Many, many, I'm giving you an example. Many. There are about, in the mouse, there are about 100 loci that are subject <coughs> to parental imprinting. And in, in, in humans, it's not clear how many. In a horse, we don't know. But again, so these two are really beautiful examples. In, and the, in those two, two examples, the decision is taken on very own, uh, sorry, is the decision to, ex, to be expressed or not is taken very early during development. In this case, the, during early embryogenesis, here it's even more complicated. It's not within your generation that the decision has been taken, but in the generation of your parents. The gametes that the parent will, trans uh, will transmit to, to, you know, to make a, a, a new being, so the sperm and the oocyte, that's during spermatogenesis, and this is during oogenesis, that you decide to put DNA methylation or whatever mark that will now say, Okay, this is coming from the father or this is coming from it, the mother. It always happens for particular organism beforehand, but for the same gene, always the same way. No, so it's different genes for different organisms. I'm sorry, no, for, for different sex. You know, the same gene for the same sex will be always disactivated. Ah, yeah, so it's a rule. Or zero. It's, it's a rule. And it's mutilation also. But now, no, it's not random. You're okay. always inactive. Okay, okay, it's not random. You always mark this gene to be inactive when it comes from the, from the female. Okay. And this marking must be done during. Genesis. And always with methylation. And it, it involves DNA methylation. That's a key point. And once you have that, then you maintain this information through the next generation. But of course, then you have, both in both cases, you erase this, this information for the subsequent generation, because then you start from scratch. And that's what I want to illustrate here. We have this beautiful set of erasures of DNA methylation, re-establishment of DNA methylation, erasure and re-establishment. This is a key um, property of um, mammalian development. This is DNA methylation level globally across the entire genome in male and in female. As you can see, both the oocyte and spermat uh, spermatozoids or sperm cells have high DNA methylation content. But as soon as you fertilize the egg, you have a traumatic reduction of DNA methylation. And we believe that, for instance, for the male pronucleus, this loss of methylation is an active process, an enzymatic process, where you actively remove the methylation within one cell division. So you haven't even started to divide, actually. You make 
to fertilize your egg, and somehow the heavily methylated sperm DNA becomes immediately demethylated through an active enzymatic process where you remove the demethylation. And then embryogenesis proceeds, you get to this uh, stage, versus which is a, a mass of cells, and now you start this de novo demethylation process. So you can expect that now DIN MT3, this de novo demethylation process, is extremely active here. And for whatever reason, this is so weird, but then you start again to lose the limitation. This time you do it in the germline. Male, of course, or the female germline, so again, lose most methylation, both sexes. And now you reestablish it according to your sex. So that's where you start to establish infringement. Okay? So this is very, very key. We have demethylation providing memory reset at every generation. Now, this is all well, and this is a kind of a gene-centered view. Gosh, it is really hot. I know that it's uh, raining, but I'm not going to uh, survive for two hours, uh, for one hour. Even. Maybe the back. So, <clears throat> you know, this is perfect. We are in a, still in a, in a gene in a, in a gene-centric view of the world, and we want to understand gene regulation, and we have now found uh, a function for delimitation as a system to provide memory of gene activity states. But one thing you have to realize is that now if you look at delimitation across the human genome, first what you know is that genes is only a tiny fraction of our genome. How much of our genome encodes proteins? How much? 1%. Yeah. 1.5%. Bit too strange. On one point five, I give you two percent if you want. Okay, but that's it. Gosh, we are left with ninety-eight percent that has absolutely no function that we can identify readily. And what is most of this non-coding DNA, as we call it? It's mostly transposon sequences. These sequences that jump around the genome, and just by the virtue of this jumping, being able to jump around the genome, accumulate, 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 without having any function, at least we don't need to invoke any function, they just populate the genome. And the end result is that now half of, your, of our genome derives from sequences that were originally retroviruses or other type of transposable elements. And that's illustrated in this particular gene, BRCA2, which is a gene involved in, uh, 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 which when defective uh, leads to breast cancer. And what you can see is that the exons are in black. Look how tiny they are, the exons. The bits that code for protein compared to all the rest, which are now just a repository of transposable element sequences. Many of them are degenerated, accumulated over time, but that's what we have in our genome. And basically, these sequences are the primary targets of demethylation. So when we talk about these big waves of demethylation, remethylation, demethylation, remethylation, it's mostly over repeat sequences. Okay, genes are only a a tiny fraction. They do also follow these waves, but we have to bear in mind that repeats are the primary targets of demethylation in mammals, but also in plants. And in mammals, it's beautiful here. I mean, this is really technical, but I don't know how familiar you are with the notion of southern blot analysis or northern blot analysis. We don't know anything about that. About that. So southern is not because it's south, it's because it's head southern. <laughs> Okay, northern blot was a derivative of southern yeah. blotting. So northern is indeed the north, the opposite of southern, but southern is a, is a, is a someone's name. Anyway, so you can show that this DNA in wild type uh, mice is heavily methylated. I'm not going to in detail, but now in a, in, a, in a mouse in which you deactivate this maintenance dynamic transfer as I talked about, DNMT1, now you lose demethylation. Don't ask me how to read this, but trust me. And the same with now RNA, when you do a northern blot to try to see expression of, of certain sequences. So here we are probing with one of these endogenous retroviruses, as we call them, ERVs. Plenty of them in human and mouse genomes. In the mouse, it's extremely active. IAP jumps like crazy. Now, in a wild-cat mouse, IAP is completely silent. No expression, no transcription. But now in a DNMT1 mouse, so you have removed the methylation. And look, now you have this huge activity 
issues, transmission and activity again, showing that delimitation is a key component of the control of transposon activity in, in, in the cell. Okay, so this is... And of course, what happens to the mice? The dead. Sorry, it's I forgot dead. to tell you that. That's obvious. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. But it dies uh, at 9.5 days, so it, you know, it, can, it can go through a few... But first, uh, the first division is okay. It's not immediate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, but how, why does it jump so, so bad at the beginning? It dies at 9.5. 9 but why the jumping of the genes not so bad at the first stages of... Oh, no, it's, the, the well, it's also, bad, but you know, there are ways of consenting. So these things are stochastic events, so they may jump in places where there is no other gene, so that's okay. You know, it's kind of okay. it's a kind of catastrophic. No, but the, event. the rate of jumping comparable to the rate of division of the So of actually the here we don't know about jumping. What we know is about transcription. Yeah. So these transposon ah, sequences get transcribed. Okay. So of course now they can jump, but we haven't actually managed to transcription jumping. problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But transcription can also be yeah. deleterious. Right. Because these sequences that you Remember, sorry, they are everywhere within a gene. So now if you transcribe all of this, now you screw up it's the proper transcription of this particular gene. So this is actually, sorry, this is a human copy and this is a mouse copy. Okay? So the two different sizes, but both are made up mostly of repeat sequences. Okay, I'm almost finished with my introduction. I want to tell you that very boring. I do. So I have to move on. I do have to move on because you, you know all about this. No? I don't know, you said yes. What shall I say? Okay, um, I'm going to focus on delimitation because this is really the topic we study in the lab and that we try to associate with this transgenerational trans epigenetics. But I want to remind you that epigenetic mechanisms, even though they are very widespread among eukaryotes, they are not universal. You find many instances of organisms which don't have delimitation. Two yeasts that are used uh, as lab uh, systems, like Cerevisiae or Pombe, do not have delimitation. Drosophila monogaster, the fly, no delimitation. C. elegans, an nematode, which is a beautiful genetic I mean, system to do genetics uh, of development, no delimitation. So you, you can have life, eukaryotic life without delimitation. But have my small genomes again. Is there a reason Most of them, but uh, I'm sure, I mean, you, your, your point is correct, but you do have actually organisms with, I mean, moderate sized genomes that do not have delimitation. So it's not really simply a, a question of the quantity of transposable right. elements, right. the content, no, no. It's not as simple as that. They have other ways of controlling that transposon. And some of these other ways are this mechanism of RNA interference that you heard a lot about from Annick last. Uh, last week. So this is a very important system which can go in parallel or in conjunction with delimitation to control repeat sequences. Okay, so that's important when you hear around, you know, this, all this excitement about delimitation and so on. Okay, we have it. Plants have it, but not everyone has it. And there are ways of controlling these repeat sequences or memorizing uh, uh, gene activity states that do not depend on delimitation. And I'm just going to drop one one word or one name here, it's polycom. If you remember, you know, that's another way which is independent of limitation by which you can perpetuate what gene activity is, states. What is starving? Sorry? Starving. In one place you could starve. Does it mean something? Yes. At the mouse. That's all. Because people are obsessed with the mouse. So they have to put it as a mouse one. So the mouse has many things, has delimitation plus plus the prior, uh, the small RNA pathways, the RNA patterns pathways, plants have both systems as well, and then you have all kind of variations between these two, okay? Now, what we're going to do is the subject of my lecture today, it's genetics. And genetics starts 117 years ago now, with the rediscovery of Mendel's laws of inheritance. And I'm not going to describe them, you all know that. Uh, you have this no blending, there is segregation, there is independent uh, assortment of, uh, of, uh, of, of characters that are not associated with each other. So, if, for instance, you know, the color of petals, the size of fruits could be separated, and therefore they will have their own rules of, of, uh, of inheritance. But what have we done in, since 1900 until we got to the central dogma? We have equated genetics to DNA. Okay. At 
first genes were GR sequencing. But in 1953, that was the end of it. Because now we knew how you could perpetuate genetic information encoded in a DNA from one cell division to the next, and of course from one generation to the next, through this semi-replicative, uh, semi-concerted system of replication. Yeah. So when you have an A, you know that you have to put a T opposite. When you have a G, you know, you know that you put a C. So we have a central dogma, and everything that is genetic must be written in a DNA sequence. So if you have a white petal and a pink and a red petal, and you can show that they are breeding true, so basically there are two different alleles of the same gene, so one has a form, the other one has another form, you have to find a DNA sequence difference that corresponds to these two different forms. That's what we do when we do human genetics nowadays. We want to associate differences in DNA sequence between all of us with differences in predisposition to disease, etc., etc. All of these GWAS, genome-wide association studies. Yeah? Well, now, this is also part of the reality. Not everything is actually described or written in a DNA sequence. And this is a beautiful example in tomato, where you have a mutant phenotype. You have a fruit here that cannot ripen. So this tomato is called colorless non-ripening. This mutant breed, uh, breeds true. So basically, it follows all of Mendel's laws. The two characters, sorry, the two, uh, this, this variant compared to, to, to the white type state does uh, follow Mendelian inheritance. It's a single locus with a recessive mutation. But when you sequence now the DNA of Siena compared to the white type, you end up with the same DNA sequence. So you can do genetics. Genetics, that's what we are doing, Mendelian genetics. Of course, this is an extreme case, but I want to you know, use this to, this to make the point that we can do genetics without differences in DNA sequence. What you have instead is difference in chromatin states, in DNA methylation states. So here, what you, and we know quite a bit about this particular uh, system. Here you have one locus, which is responsible for mutant versus white type. So this has been determined genetically with all kind of tricks that we have, with markers uh, on the chromosome that allow us to follow segregation. So we know that this is a locus which is responsible for this difference. As I said, when you sequence, you get the same DNA sequence in both cases. But what we find is that now this particular allele, which is actually the same allele as this one, is heavily methylated in its uh, in, 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 uh, close to the gene, whereas this one is not methylated. And this methylation associates with silencing of the gene. And this one is not. Well, we see this DNA difference in the somatic cell or in germ cells? Everywhere. Well, yeah, of course, the studies have been done only in somatic cells. So, in, in germ cells, there might be different. We believe that this is not the yeah. case. Yeah. yeah. So, here, what we have is what we call an epimutation. A change in epigenetic state of this particular locus, or this particular allele of the locus. Now, as this allele, which is the same as this one, okay, can exist in two alternative epigenetic states. What is remarkable is that this heavy methylation associated with silencing now is perpetuated through multiple divisions. And it breeds through. It follows an normal slope. There is no change in DNA sequence, and yet we can inherit phenotypic variation according to Mendel's law. So this is now a repeat sequence, a transposable element. I want to remind you that this is the primary target of DNA methylation in plants as well as in mammals. So we believe that what happened is that you know you have this transposon sequence upstream of the gene, and somehow, of course, it's targeted for DNA methylation, so it is silent. And as a result, the gene is perfectly expressed here. But now this DNA methylation seems to have spread, we don't know how, through the nearby uh, promoter sequence of the gene, through the nearby gene. And this spreading now is the re resulting in this shutting down of the gene and therefore the mutant phenotype. So we also probably have a molecular mechanism here to propose. So it's not a, a, a mutation in DNA sequence, it's an epimutation, a change in epigenetic states associated with uh, a change in DNA methylation. But now it's, just, it's not just plants who do it, which do it, sorry. Mouse, mice do it too, but in a, it's more complex. 
despite this programming I'm, I talk about the field manipulation states, you can have situations where, again, repeat sequences, these are the transposons, I always put them in the triangle, are inserted within a gene or next to a gene, and depending on the methylation status, that or the transposon sequence, now the gene is on or off. So you have the same DNA sequence, but now the gene is on, here the gene is off, and somehow these different epi-allelic states can be transmitted to the protein. It's not purely Mendelian, it's more complicated now than you know, this beautiful sorting of uh, uh, petal colors or whatever, or shape, but it is still transmissible. And it follows some kind of familial pattern. The same with this particular mutation here, axin field. Depending on the methylation status of the repeat sequence, the gene will be on and off, and this state can be transmitted independently of any change in DNA sequence. That's what we call transgenerational epigenetics. Changes in a chromatin state that do not correspond to a change in DNA sequence that can be transmitted through multiple generations. So now, this is not controversial. But what we don't know at this stage is how much of that occurs in nature. So basically, how much of what we call genetic variation. When we, now, nowadays, when we think of genetic variation, the fact that we all differ by certain characteristics that we have uh, which have been transmitted uh, um, from our parents, okay? How much of these genetic differences are actually caused not by changes in DNA sequence, but changes in chromatin states that can be perpetuated through multiple generations? So now we're not in a developed like context. Now there is no resetting. We have two alternative states, or maybe a gradation of states, as you, in ADT, actually, ADT, but you can see that you exist in a multiple range of states between fully unmethylated and, and with a yellow fur and fully methylated with a agouti fur, but you can also be intermediate with some transmission of these intermediate states as well. So how much of that genetic variation that we describe around us is caused by similar things? And that's an important question. Why? Because of something that has been now plaguing what we all these genome-wide association studies that have been performed for the last uh, 15 years. So why did we sequence the human genome in 2001? Because, not because it's beautiful, because we, we believed, I mean, not me, but people who were promoting this, believed that by having the entire sequence of the genome at our disposal will help us understand the genetic origin of disease. Because now we could monitor differences in the sequence between individuals and associate these differences between individuals to differences in phenotypes, which could be inherited. And there is one beautiful example of uh, heritable phenotype in, in humans, height. We all differ in height here, not because of what we ate when we were in our, in, in our mother's womb or when, what we ate when, uh, during our childhood, but because of what our parents transmitted in terms of genetic information. No, no, I think we were tremendous. It was tremendous acceleration in Japan, the uh, average. Right. Or even so the, the, judge, the judge that you, we can take, yeah. we can factor all of these yeah. effects, okay? And still, at the end of the day, we can explain about 80% of our differences in height here by what was transmitted from our parents. No, not in Japan, you see it by age. In Japan, it's by age. You can see no, no, immediately no, no. tremendous please, differences. Please, please, believe me, okay? So there is a confusion here. Yeah. Globally, at the species level, differences in height in humans are mostly determined by our genes. And genes, I'm not saying DNA, yeah. Yeah. genes, the concept, right. of what, okay? So it's genetic, net genetically determined. And we have tools now to associate this humongous level of variation in DNA sequence between individuals with differences in height. And a study has been performed, starting with 10,000 individuals and a million polymorphisms across the genome, and then 40,000 in individuals and 10 million of polymorphism. And when you combine all of these studies, which by the way must have cost of the order of 20 to 30 million euros, you end up explaining 10 to 15 percent of the 80 percent heritability that genetics predicts. So the trait is genetic. 80 percent of the variation between any of us here has to do with our genes, not of our environment. And yet, when you look at the DNA sequence to try to explain it, 
using the power of whole genome sequencing and <coughs> huge cohorts, etc., you extend you extend 10% of this 80%. So what you have is this huge problem of missing heritability. Where it is where is genetics gone? Yes. What would be your definition of heritability? It's a it's a genetic definition. It's in quantitative mm -hmm. genetics, so I don't want to go into the details again here, but you know this has been this is 30 or 40 years of mathematical modeling of, gen of genes, multi-genes, etc., and how you, you accommodate for that. You know, away from environmental influences. That's a key point. So, yes, we have this huge problem of missing heritability. So what I'm going to tell you today is not that I have the answer for this problem of missing heritability is for epigenetics, but epigenetics could be one of the contributors of this missing heritability. If we have the example of agotivariable Diego or or other phenotypes in the mouse, plus what we know in plants. You know, why should we discard this notion that differences in chromatin state could indeed be transmitted across generations and contribute to, uh, to, to, um, to part of these heritable phenotypes that we, that we measure? OK. Um, how much do you want me to talk for? Oh, but we can, you know, I'm happy to stop here. No, 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 no truly. Right. Don't, don't, don't feel embarrassed. No, 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 no. I have a question. No, but what also is good, I've been saying, you don't care about my own work. What you care is about the concept. So I'm, I'm happy to actually yeah, discuss with you and to show what we have done. Okay, in that check, what we have done is to show that this is not, this is not uh, marginal. We have ways now of measuring it. Of course, in a model system, which is this plant, Aradidopsis, you can't do it in humans, you can't do it in, in a mouse because of lethality. But basically, uh, I'm not going to show this slide because it's too much. We can manipulate the limitation in plants without compromising viability or fertility of our individuals. So we can do genetics with individuals which have now far less methylation than the wild type, for instance. And then we can see how much of these differences of methylation that were induced experimentally, artificially, can be transmitted across generations, independent of anything else happening in the genome. So we, you know, we fix our genome, and we simply play with what we call the methylo part of the epigenome, and how much of that can be transmitted. And we found that you know, even in a genome as simple as one of our epilepsies, where repeat sequencing, which may be the mediators of these epigenetic, epigenetic effects, I'm talking about the one that uh, uh, go across generations, even in our where we have so few repeat sequences, we can find thousands of loci across the genomes for which a change in methylation state that we have induced experimentally can persist for 10, 15, 20, 30 generations and follows Mendel's laws. So there is genetics, absolutely. There is a dimension of genetics which does occur independently and in addition to the one contributed by DNA sequence variation. So that's my take-home message. I'm sorry, I cannot convince you because I, I, I don't see if it's, I have time to show you the result. No, you don't need to know, honestly, the details. It's boring, trust me. <laughs> I, 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 I think it answers my question that I, I have to ask before. Uh, but uh, I know that there's a huge difference between plants and animals. Plants you can induce the reality for many, many generations. Whereas for animals, You're right. You're right. I mean, and I, sh and, and I gave you part of the explanation. I didn't, I didn't bore you with more details, but I gave you part of the explanation. So we have these ways of demethylation or methylation. So of course you don't expect epigenetic alteration that will happen by accident, like the one I described where you, you know, demethylation spread from a repeat into a nearby sequence, to be faithfully transmitted across generations if you can erase it and then start from scratch. But despite this beautiful system of double erasure, right early during embryogenesis, and in the two germlines, you still have this example I described. You still have agotibayable yellow and axin fuse. And I can show you, I mean, you know, people, it's complicated because now the genetics is not true, truly Mendelian genetics. So 
The transmission across generations is more complex, and it is extremely influenced by the environment, it is extremely influenced by the genetic makeup. So, all kind of things that we can deal with much more readily uh, in our experimental systems with plants, but there is no reason to believe that this does not, I mean, first, it is uh, what we don't know, and I'm therefore going to conclude with my conclusion. I'm sorry about all of this skipping, but you... <laughs> That's fine, that's fine, honestly. What matters is this. That we can induce this epidemic variation which is uh, uh, associated with transposon sequences, transposable element sequences, quite readily in the lab. And I'm sure, I know, if, if we can't do it in, in mammals because it's not variable. That's the only, and, but clear to me this is, it's not because I was fundamentally different between mammals and plants. It's just that in mammals, the limitation has been now Co-opted for gene regulation to an extent which is much larger than in plants. So the primary function is to target repeat sequences in both systems. But now in mammals, you have this selection activation, you have this imprinting, which has you know, taken quite a, a, a bit of space uh, functionally, and you can't dispense with them. In plants, we have a bit of genetic imprinting. Somehow it's only found in one tissue called the endosperm, which surrounds the, uh, the, the embryo in the seed but not elsewhere in, during development. So it's inconsequential if you can survive, you know, seed formation and you can make a plant. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I haven't told you, but what we have established in the lab, we find in nature. We have the tools now in our of seeds to go uh, to nature, collect thousands of accessions, of strains across the globe, and sequence their genome, not, I mean, not only sequence their genome, but also identify they are methylone at the single nucleus, at a single cytosine resolution. And what we find is that the, 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 the epidemic variation that we induce in the lab also exists in nature. And in the lab, we could establish that you know, this epigenetic variation that we induce has different stability. Depending on, on sequences, some of them will be transmitted for hundreds of generations, but other sequences will revert back to the default methylated state. Explain the how could be. Why? What's the difference? Ah, well, yeah, but that's, that's too molecular. I mean, and I don't think, we, I don't want, I mean, I would love to, to tell you another time. We have the mechanisms. It has to do with the way these sequences are targeted by another system that reinforces the methylation, which is this. No, 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 the no, surrounding the side, yeah? The methylation mechanism, on, all it knows, uh, in the process of uh, the reproduction, only surrounding the DNA, right? So it might be read by the sequence. So DNA, the sequence tells you, already, what the, so there is absolutely a component of DNA sequence. And so that's what we find when we create across the genome all of these epidemic variations. We realize that they are not all equally stable across generations. So it's encoded in, in, in it DNA? Encoded, absolutely, you're right. Yeah. But it is encoded in the DNA, ultimately. Yeah. But now, what you have to consider that, okay, we have a sequence here, which has some feature, for which we can play with DNA replication states, across multiple generations. Independently of the rest, the rest is completely unified. I mean, sorry, we never touch the genome sequence. Yeah. Yeah. We simply force demethylation, etc. Right. And now we realize that this loss of methylation that we can induce experimentally over repeat sequences can be transmitted. We haven't changed the DNA sequence there or anywhere else in the genome. But now we have another sequence in the same genome for which we also managed to lose the, I mean, to induce a loss of methylation. And what we realize is that after two or three generations, methylation has come back to it. So there was a very strong reversion to the default methylated state. So what I'm saying is that this sequence and this sequence are different in their behavior, and sure enough, are different when we look at the sequence itself. Okay. So there is a feature of the DNA sequence itself yeah. that is more permissive. And do we some repeat. Can you classify sequences? No, so I mean, we have to do machine learning, yeah. we have to come to right. mathematicians, physicians, whatever, to try to how, no, no, how long is this? Is, is so it's a few KBs because these are repeat sequences. And, so, and, and we're getting there, but you know, we could only do it by first artificially inducing these changes in the lab in a constant genome environment. That's really really key because epigenetics, I told you, is the fact that you can exist in two different chromatin states or methylation states independently of the DNA sequence. And now you can transmit it as well, independently of changes of, of DNA sequence. But now, 
different repeat sequences, different transposons across the genomes behave differently. So clearly there are things that are written in the DNA sequence itself that tells you, yes, I can be immutable, or no, I cannot be, because I will always get back with high efficiency my default mutilated state. Now what's nice is that this is what we established in the lab with a constant genome. But when we went to nature, we found exactly the same type of differences of mutilation states. And of course, the one that in the lab we define as the most stable one. So the change in mutilation state that you can transmit for many, many generations, we find it more often in nature than the one for which in the lab we can only exist in the non-default state, which is the unmetallated state for one or two generations because immediately it recovers to the mutilation. But these ones in the lab, we rarely find them in, in, in nature because they always go back to the default state. But this place is more in the genes or in the... Uh, no, it always repeats. No, and which one? Or, uh, all these repeats. I speak all repeats, but I told you, repeats. these repeats have an impact on nearby genes. Yes. So that's how it's, it's working. It's not gene regulation. It's transposon control, but with a consequence on nearby genes. That's the key point. So this, there is a, an element of genetics which is completely uh, away from genes here. I mean, away, not completely away, but you cannot identify it within a change in DNA sequence or whatever, but which clearly contribute to heritable differences in phenotypes as well. So that the last thing that we did in the lab, of course, is experimentally, molecularly demonstrate that we could have these different epileptic states generated from and, and transmitted from multiple generations or not. So that we could associate these differences with differences in phenotype. With precision, transposon so, may change because there is this no, no yeah, yeah. mutilation at the first stage. So and that's another thing that we, of course, explore yeah. is that once we have transposons being manipulated in terms of methylation states, as I showed you, we can reactivate them. And if you reactivate transcriptionally the transposon, now you can start to change. So we have this sort of I mean, it's not a problem. But, but they have, jump in the, in the embryonic development at the first stage when there is no ventilation. Yeah, and so we can, can, yeah, and so we have, now we are playing with both. I mean, not playing, but we are taking into account yeah. the two aspects. So purely epigenetic aspects, so the sequence can exist in two alternative states for different stabilities across generations. And that contributes, therefore, to genetics to a different degrees depending on this stability. And we have now these sequences that are, we have artificially moved into the, um, not moved, we have shifted to the unmethylated state, this non-default epigenetic state, and that now start to be every year transcribed, and some of them start to jump. So now we create what people call genetic variation, what I would call DNA sequence variation. Both are genetic variation because they follow index rules, or rules of inheritance, okay? So now what we can do is see what are the two seem to generate more phenotypic uh, diversity, which could be noted. Is it the jumping of transposons, or is it the alternative epigenetic states of a residing transposon? And clearly the two contribute to phenotypic variation. And I think between humans, or mammals and plants, there would be this issue of, you know, again, of transposon mobili mobilization compared to epigenetic variation in of transposons, plus the stability across generations, which we predict to be far less in, uh, in, 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 uh, in mammals than it is in plants, but not completely ruled out. And uh, if some of you uh, really want to know, I mean, you know, the, I mentioned this retro transposon sequence, though, sorry, this transposable element sequence I use, we have all this terminology, uh, I apologize for that, or this endogenous retroviruses, as others call them. IAP in the mouse, extremely aggressive. It jumps like crazy. Well, IAP, when we see these waves of methylation, demethylation in early embryogenesis and in the germ, germ IAP stays methylated all along. So they are not reset. So now imagine if by accident you lose methylation over an IAP, maybe there is no mechanism to re establish it because it does not go through this programming of loss and gain. It's supposed to be, by default, methylated. Like we have in France, repeats are supposed to be methylated. And we see them methylated throughout life in plants. Okay, you don't see this at all. And now the IFPs behave like a plant repeat, constantly methylated, the young ones, the ones that are the most aggressive. And indeed are the ones that also created these epi alleles at 
Aguti by Everlilo, and next you choose the two phenotypes that I showed you. Questions? I didn't, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, but my problem is, uh, did you explain or wrong? But, so during this, uh, this, uh, my programming? Exactly. So when it goes to zero? It never goes to zero. Okay. But, I mean, I'm losing, so the system is losing, losing information, and then uh, the mutilation which is after is random? No. So it's, so again. So you're keeping information, if, if no. you're keeping information out. <clears throat> so it's, it's very interesting, actually. First, what should, uh, yeah, so let's look, I mean, now we're talking about mammoth by definition, because we have these ways of mutilation and mutilation. By default, the entire genome is mutilated. By default, the entire genome is mutilated. Every cytosine in a CPG by nucleotide will be mutilated, except when you have a high density of CPGs that are the so-called CPG islands. For whatever reasons, these things get protected from the mutation. But otherwise, you lose everywhere, and you put back everywhere. So there is no targeting to be done, okay? But now, as I said, some small subset of repeat sequences never go through this. They go maybe like that, like that, but that's it. So they're actually heavily methylated throughout life. So in those, uh, those which are, uh, which transmits yeah. genes in this, State. Well, these are these active transposons sitting in genes, which for whatever reason, we still don't know molecularly, why they lost methylation. But if they're not part of this reprogramming, you know, if you lose it, then there is no instruction to remethylate, maybe. No, but wait, wait, but if you completely lost Even though it's right? by default, you should methylate everywhere. How particular location for methylation can be heritable? If they, in some stations, where can they all disappear? How do you know where to come, where to methylate? That's what I'm saying. There, is some there is no, the default state throughout the genome is for methylation to be to be uh, to be enforced. No, but, but, but then, but then, the still is different. Right? These inheritable features, some region methylated, not and this inheritable. In some moment, it being lost or being everything being methylated, become exactly information getting lost completely. So if, if everybody methylated in this region or demethylated, you don't know. Who so there is very little dynamics of the methylation um, in relation to. To gene regulation. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, contradic I'm, I'm contradicting myself here. What we have is this beautiful association between methylation states and, and, and X inactivation yeah. and, and imprinting. But again, so what you have to realize is that now this is a few, well, a few genes. There is a thousand or so genes on the inactive X, on, on the X, so maybe a thousand genes that are involved there. They all have this CPG island I'm talking about. So these by default are never methylated except if you decide to target them. But this is a minority of the methylation that you find in the genome. The majority of the, diff of, of the methylation you find in the genome is, of course, in non-CPG island, by definition, and it's everywhere. No, but then they can be, cannot repeat. be inheritable. No feature with, with the methylation can be inheritable. If you lose information, so you have some feature of, of organism, and then something is inherited, something is not, and then at some moment it's being information lost, so you can't recover it. So it cannot be inheritable. So the way I describe it, except it's, it's a really a purely known, which will be a huge amount So, <clears throat> okay, let me try to, I'm, I think I understand your, 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 your point or your question, but let me try to then rephrase what, I'm, what I said so far. Is that we know that we have these waves of demethylation and methylation. Right. So there clearly there is mechanisms to dictate, first to remove methylation across the genome, it's not a perfect process, as I said, you know, there are some sequences that escape from this. And then to say, okay, let's remethylate it. But when you look at the across the genome, it seems that most cytosines will be remethylated. So there is no much targeting of specific sequences. You see no, what I mean? So then can be cannot be inheritable. Because exactly. Might... Yeah, yeah, it's not inherited. Yeah, right. yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Okay, but what and is yet, it? yeah, but yes, something is inherited. It's not inherited, for sure. Most things are, and that's why you, you know, things work in mammals because they're not inherited. But you have examples in which you have now these aberrations. Ah, this aberration. Ah, this inheritable is aberration. It's not regulation. This yeah. is an aberration. This is not a, a very healthy mouse, actually. This one is diabetic. This is a, a healthy mouse. It's a mutant. Okay, okay. So, so this is really rare. It's a mutant. I mean, you know, we are all different in uh, our susceptibility to diabetes. We are all different in height. 
is a genetic. But this is a rare case. case. So this is being inheritable mm -hmm. is a rare case. On the other hand, you said yes, these are rare cases. These are exceptions. But I don't know what exception. I mean, how exceptional are they? I have no idea. And could they be, you know, a big part of this missing heritability? I have no idea. That's a question. So oh, this wave may be not so uniform after all. It's yeah. not uniform. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. My pleasure. Okay. More questions? What was the one? Yeah, well, we, but we can see we missed something. Yeah, maybe. We, oh, we, we missed a lot. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, I mean, there was no way we can. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to do one of that talk. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's fine. I think. You know, you're getting the message across that basically, at least in mammals, we have a system which will ensure that there is no such thing as transmission across generations of this methylation space. Yeah? But you have ex accidents which have been documented, which are complicated to document because the genetics is more complex than the simple Mendelian genetics of, you know, peas. Uh, shape or uh, petal uh, color, but nonetheless, they are, they are, you know, there is a familiar transmission, you know, that there are pedigrees you can, you can follow, etc. And it's not just cultural transmission, it's definitely, you know, with the mouse you can, you can play around and show that there is an element of inheritance there. And then there was this issue of not being able to explain much of what we call genetic inheritance in humans with your simple set of DNA sequence variants that have been collected. But this variation, the inheritable one, this 80%, the inheritable ones all just random colors. So this uh, variation. This is a, it is, genetics is 80%. So you expect to, to be able to document it with what you inherit from your parents, the genes, the DNA sequence. No, but it's maybe neither maturation, neither something else, some factor. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. That could be something else. Some other variation, yes. No, which are not inheritable, they're just variation found on the light. No, no, they are, no, 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 they are heritable. We have the tools to analyze these things. No, Absolutely. But you don't have so many generations of humans to say they're inheritable. Yes, you need three or four generations. You need three, you know, on yeah. the... On, on say the four generations of humans, it's not you need You need two on the paternal side and you need three on the maternal side. So mother has, of course, when she's pregnant, she has a fetus, right. and the fetus has its own germline. Right. So you need to go one generation after to make sure that it's not an environmental effect. Okay? But for the father, you just have to make sure that the, the father carries the spermatozoids, right. so spermatozoids But you can see phenotypically, right, when we're looking at the germ cells, yeah? Here no, you have some actual observable variation between humans, not variation in the DNA, but the variation between humans you can see so easily, right? It takes time. Well, you have, you have variation which is caused by the environment, and you have variation which is caused by through a regression between parents and offspring, you can show that this is genetic. Okay. So we have ways of calculating, of analyzing these, diff these, these two contributions to... But you don't know many factors in the environment. Most of them you don't know. That's fine. It's a big error. Yeah. I mean, that's what you put into your, uh, your environmental factor. It's all the, the things that you cannot account for through pedigree analysis. Okay, so there is environmental factor, and there is something, when you say 80% there's an environmental. 80% is non-environmental, that's what I'm saying. But how can you say that? Not me, these guys. Yeah, 60 yeah. years of uh, genetics, of human genetics. I mean, you have to teach them maybe how to, to do proper uh, genetic studies, but that's the consensus now is that. Well, I guess I don't know what is the basis. It's quantitative it's genetics. Yeah. So you have ways of partitioning through so pedigree analysis what you can. But how you measure, even measuring phenotype is so vague, yeah, how you can say. Whether the phenotype similar or not, was feature present or not present? How well, you know, height is a, it's a quantitative trait, so you have exactly... Uh, it's exactly about height. Yeah, this is height. Uh, all this about height. Yeah, but I mean, okay. I, you can, I, so the, the principle of, I mean, sorry, most genetic traits in humans are quantitative traits. Disease, if we focus on disease, diseases that are caused by a single gene <laughs> being defective are a minority. Most diseases are caused by what we are, po what are polygenic, polygenic in, in terms of determinism. So are caused by many variants over many, many genes. So we are now in... No, but also this BOM also is made from instrumentation, rather, yeah. So 
be on your kind of bacteria living in your gas, you have a contribution in half of that, right? Yes, you so have that too. This was a you have it, how, so you don't how, transmit your, your Which is partly your inheritable. Partly, but not completely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, all of this is being factored into this, this equation that allows you at the end to determine that around 80% of differences in human height is genetic. Of course, I don't know how, even what percentage means in this sense. Yeah. It means that if you measure differences between all of us here, and it has, of course, to do with our populations, and you take care of you know, the history of uh, where you were born, and therefore the kind of food that you, you were exposed to, whether there was famine uh, in, in one generation or two generations. Okay. So you put all of these factors into your and then mixed, you linear linear model, dominant, yeah. mixed linear model, whatever. Right. At the end of the day, you still end up with 80% of this variation that you can attribute to pedigree. But this, we would say, it's genomic or epigenomic now, so say it's, it's genomic. That's like purely, 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 purely genetic. DNA, that's DNA. what these guys mean. That's, right. you know, yeah. that was the premises of my, of my presentation. But then she that everything in gene uh, according, you know, genetics nowadays but you say is equated to DNA sequence variation. And what I'm telling you is that this cannot be the case. But, yeah, but only 5% is understood, but then uh, confused about this picture. So you know 80% genetic, but then the second diagram says it's 75% missing. Yeah. It, well, it's missing in relation to DNA sequence variation. Okay. A, 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 a correlation between genomic sequence and exactly. 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 This correlation can only explain 5%. Well, here it was 5%. They have improved it now by Increasing the wait, wait, wait. You, you know it's determined by, by genetics, but what exactly are you missing? So you know sequence, forget about this 20%. Sequence determines your height, so to speak. And then what are you missing? Well, that's what I'm saying. If you think that sequence determines your height, you are falling short of the explanation because if you take all the information of the sequence that we have nowadays, and we have a lot, we have a profusion of individuals that have been sequenced, we have, we know all their variants along the genome. Yes. And when you do your associations, your correlation with, with height. But you don't know which part of the genome, because it's such a huge space, you just don't know what to correlate. So it's a kind of logistic. Well, it's, addi it's additive. This is what we call additive. Uh, it's not biological, kind of combinatorial. That's such a huge thing, and you don't know what Well, that's, that's a, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, these are very important questions that we have in our face, uh, that we are facing in, in, in the field of quantitative genetics and population genetics, uh, and human population genetics in particular. What people realize that clearly they got it wrong. Is there, it's not such thing as 80% heritability, maybe it's much less, or they have to look for other explanations than this variant they are looking for in the DNA sequence. And we know that you know, most of the variants that have been used in these studies are what we call SNPs, yeah. single nucleotide polymorphisms. Okay? That is only part of the variation that we have in our DNA. We have copy number variants. We have rare variants with large effects, so-called rare alleles with large effects. They are never uh, computed into this, this calculation. Ah, I see. So only that. SNPs, only SNPs anyway. Only it? SNPs. And ah. the SNPs are clearly only part of the explanation. Yes. And that's the problem we have. And, and, and you know, now the latest that came out, uh, one, I think one or two weeks ago, I can't remember if it was in science or in uh, nature or whatever, but was an opinion on this and saying that, well, maybe, Every bit of every sequence, uh, every nucleotide in, in, in your DNA contributes to your phenotype. And therefore, it's not just maybe 10, 20, 30 major genes that are important to, you know, in, in determining height, but maybe it's almost everything which defeats the purpose. Yeah, that's finding so that's the yeah. genetic origin of disease or whatever. You see what I mean? So they, could, they, are, they are talking about only genetic disease. No, of course, it's a surrender. I mean, maybe it's a reality, but then you know, forget about any of the approaches we 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 have uh, we have been promoting for the past twenty years, yeah. which is to try to find the set of genes of loci, assuming that there are not just one, but not thousands, that determine these major differences between us. Well, it's, so it's four nucleotides, because it's not a few space. Which is simply 
dynamic relation is a post replication modification. No. It's not a base. It does not exist as a free nucleotide. You have to have an enzyme that goes into the DNA. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. With a slight difference in the way you get it. Uh, yes, because it's because it, needs it needs the information on the other side. This may be transferred, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, it, and these mutations are so-called genetic mutations. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Well, that would be tiny. So you get the C2 T transitions. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and so, and, and so you get the C2 T transitions. Yes. 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 That's exactly what I mean. That's what I did here. I hope for well, maybe I missed uh, and, and, and I missed a mark here. But basically, what I'm telling you is that genetics is made up of more than just DNA sequence variation. So there is a continuum between epigenetic variation and DNA sequence variation. Okay, to explain genetics, to explain in your yes, and, and 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 where do you the partition, I don't know. I mean, if you have inheritance for just three generations, you want to really spend a lot of time talking about this in a genetic context, where clearly you know you assume that things are so stable that you are going to make a cross of a multiple generation and still get the same result. Why not? But it is in many human studies, the only thing that you do is you your pedigrees are you, your parents, and your grandparents. Maybe your great grandparents, and that's, that's about it. And then you go into population studies if you want to go beyond that. But so, so we have this continuum. It would be nice for me to also discuss with uh, Anik. I asked her the same, I mean, I need the same remark, and she reacted in a totally different way. Well, but I mean, I'm doing genetics. I, I, mean, I didn't show you any genetic experiment that we did, but that's what I'm doing. I'm doing genetics. I want to understand what underlies the inheritance of and we have been told that DNA explains everything. DNA sequence variation explains the differences between characters when these differences are heritable. And clearly, this is not just that. Now, the question is how much of this other system of inheritance, which is parallel to DNA sequence mutation, how much of this system contributes to this heritable variation that we see? And how much of this subsystem is actually influenced by the environment? And, 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 that, and that the last question, which of course I didn't, I put that in my summary with the red, you know, young drama, because to this day, we're completely still, you know, hand waving. We all assume that genet epigenetics is so labile that the environment must be what influences it. But the, the evidence is very poor right now. What we have is, yes, we know that uh, genes in their activity respond to the environment. So, you know, heat shock uh, has an impact. Uh, you have a uh, Hemosensitive addicts of genes, etc. So we know genes don't function in the isolation, they function in the environment. But now, how much this environment can now have long lasting consequences in inducing or erasing some epigenetic states? This is still a very, very open question. We tried in a lab very hard to induce the same changes that we have induced through experimental systems just by playing with the environment. And we failed so far. So and it makes sense, you know, if we have, you know, this kind of Mendelian genetics at, at one extreme, just playing with DNA mutation, you know, you would expect that the environment every two minutes will erase that, otherwise we would have never had it in the first place. So again, we have a continuum of situations. We have a very stable epigenetic. But exactly what you wanted to do, what you couldn't, can explain specifically. Well, I tried to induce epigenetic variation 
of the kind that we have been used using a trick, and I'm not going to go into the trick we have used, that's not relevant for today's talk. But, so we have tried to, to induce this uh, epigenetic variation that we can readily... In plants, right? In plants, of course, it's all in plants. Uh, try to do it with the environment. And everything that we have tried to do failed in terms of transmitting it to the next generation. Well, it failed on two grounds. We failed to induce the same amplitude of methylation changes than the one that we have induced through genetic tricks. Okay? So that's the first thing. We, we haven't managed to find an environment in which we, for instance, can erase the methylation state of the transposon to such an extent that it resembles what we have done using the genetic trick. And second, the few changes that we have managed to induce with environment in terms of methylation states over repeat sequences, none of them can be transmitted. Some of them may be transmitted to the progeny, to the immediate progeny, what we call parental effects. But that's it. Next generation, forget it. They're not there anymore. So, and that's a big, you know, there is a lot of excitement about the environment, you know. Uh, but but it, I guess at the, at the end of the day, so it also boils down to what people put behind the word epigenetics. For many people, epigenetics is gene regulation. And I'm fine by that. Gene regulation. I mean, genes in, in, in the expression are sensitive to the environment. You know, the heat shock response, the uh, uh, genes, uh, antifreeze uh, protein in, uh, in, in, in strawberries, the gene is on only when it's you know, minus, uh, minus two degrees. The gene is off at uh, from temperature. Okay. So these genes respond to signaling cascades to their environment. Vernalization is another case in plants. I mean, plants are beautiful examples of genes responding to their environment. But all of these responses are plastic and fully reversible, and it makes sense. It's not because you're freezing today that you're going to freeze in the summer. Therefore, you know, you need now to have your antifreeze, but not when the summer is there. What's the point of making a protein that costs money and energy when, when there is no need for it? So. So, so far that I did with this very short list of known inherited epigenetic changes, very few of that. Quite a example. few. I, I gave you, I, I mean, so I mean with, with strong phenotypic uh, effects, probably a handful of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if I were more careful, uh, so in my, uh, in my reviewing of, of these cases, maybe we can go to 100, maybe, I don't know. In different species. Okay. In different species. But now, with our genome-wide approach in our experimental mm -hmm. system, there are thousands of those now, potentially, mm -hmm. with epigenetic variation, and we find that in nature. Now, we don't know how many of these low sites do have visible phenotypic consequences because now we are dealing with quantitative traits, so it's such a difference when the flower, the height of the plant, you know, the way the root grows, these are very subtle phenotypes. But we can show that. There is always segregation, depending genome wide, we do what we call this quantitative trait low side mapping, QTL mapping, and we can associate differences of methylation with different phenotypes. But I'm going to tell you. How many genes we will, have, we will find in, in phenotypic? But the potential is, is pretty good, or uh, pretty large, even for a genome as small as our with so few repeat sequences to start with. So the potential is there. But the, the inheritance may be just for a few generations. But you know, because we are dealing with a continuum, I think that's what, what is important. It might be for one generation, and then forget it, it's not genetic, it's parental effects. It could be for two or three generations. Ah, it's starting to be a bit more complex. It could be 10, 15 generations. It could be 100 generations. It could have mutation consequences. If you have 5 methyl cytosine, of course, you mutate more often than if you are not methylated, etc., etc. Okay. So now we have a complexity. We have richness that compose genetic inheritance, which we didn't consider even 10 years ago. And we only consider it now because we have the tool also to consider it. Now we can sequence a methylome. We can have, you know, exact methylation information for individual cytosine across the entire gene. It's complicated, actually. No, it's very simple. So we can, and we have, we have done, I mean, we have done in the lab, you know, tens of methylomes, but now a consortium has done one, uh, 800 methylomes. So you have taken 800 strands of our losses, all across the globe. Our losses has colonized the entire northern hemisphere, so you can pick some strains in, in China, in Japan, in, uh, in uh, Central Asia, 
in uh, Spain, in America, North America. So you have also COVID data, it's beautiful because in North America it really came with the, the first column, so 400 years ago. So you have a very recent genetic bottleneck and then an expansion there. So we have all of these methylos that are disposal. And we can see you know, how stable they are, how they fluctuate in relation to climate, environment, but also in relation to the sequence variation. Because of course, all of these accessions have different genomes, and indeed, plenty of SNPs that distinguish one from the other. And things that we cannot explain by either environment or sequence, truly epigenetic. And we have some because we found them in the lab. So we go to nature and we find them. You now we can start to explore why, why are they there? What brought them about in the first place in nature? And all the stable, yeah? Ah, yeah, I'm talking about the ones that are stable and therefore, yeah. you know, we want to really pursue now in nature because we know in the lab they are stable and sure enough, the ones that are stable in the lab are the ones that we collect more often in nature. The ones that are unstable in the lab, the ones that go back immediately to this default methylated state, yeah. while we have difficulties in catching them in nature. And that makes perfect sense. If they are perverting, right. you, can't, you can't get them in the first place. But so you don't understand we, why some stay and some not. This no, no, no. This we don't know. And I think we need to do more modeling. We need physicists or mathematicians to help us do that. I think. 